yourself a good way to spend the next 60 minutes of your life uh, with us, hopefully. You'll enjoy it, talking mules and donkeys. And uh, yeah, we do it every single Wednesday. And uh, so I want to say welcome, especially if this is your first time ever hanging out with us. Uh, Steve, aren't we excited to be back into a rhythm and talking mules and donkeys, helping folks out every week? That's fun. Uh, you know, last week, I'll bet you 25% of our viewers were Australians. Yeah, that's right. I think the first six out of yeah. 10 comments were from... Uh, uh, we're from folks, uh, down under and we were glad to have them too. I, I think it's like morning time there, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is morning. Uh, a matter of fact, yesterday, uh, as Randy and I were heading down the I-10 heading toward New Mexico, uh, we called David up and, uh, and asked him, you know, just talk to him a little bit. He's getting, he's excited. He's got a brand new Jack donkey coming from the United States to Australia. Awesome. Postmark, yeah. sealed, signed, delivered. Uh, we've Well, speaking of Australia, Tony is watching from Victoria, Australia. We got the glockenspiel there. It's good to have you with us, Tony. Uh, if this is the first time you are hanging out with us, like I said, welcome. My name's Dave. This is Steve. And uh, there's really only three things that you are responsible for. Of course, Steve is responsible for uh, doing as best he can to tell folks what's worked for him over these last 40 years. Um, yeah. But there's only three things you're responsible for. The first thing is to just put your name in the comment section, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like. That's how we get to know you. And, uh, and that's how we get to know one another. So we want to hear from you. Put your name, where you're watching from what the weather's like in the comment section. The second thing that we ask, this is your responsibility, is ask any and every question. I've got about six questions that I've brought today, uh, and the rest of them are going to come directly from you. So uh, we will answer questions all the way up until 4 o'clock, and there is no dumb question. Uh, matter of fact, the only dumb question, you've heard it said, is the only one you don't ask because we don't want you going out there feeling like, gosh, you know, I, I didn't want to ask because I thought it was going to be dumb. And then you wind up getting hurt or hurting the animal. And that's the last thing you want to do. We know that's the last thing you want to do because you're here. And the people who are here, you guys are already winners because you've already made the choice to learn. So ask any and every question you've got. And then the third thing that we ask, and, uh, and this is a biggie, is that you share the broadcast with friends and family, folks you know, who will appreciate uh, learning about the ways of the mule and the donkey. And you do that very simply uh, on YouTube by clicking subscribe and sharing the link or on Facebook by clicking share button or just tagging somebody like you would on any other post. That's it. Um, I say we get to work and start welcoming folks, seeing how they're doing and, uh, and, and get to it. Eileen is watching. Sunny, 53 degrees in Nebraska. Snow is coming again, though. I would love some snow. Uh, Tony says it's 9 a.m. in Australia, and it's going to be 27 degrees in Newham, Victoria. So 27 degrees Celsius. That'll be a comfortable day, I'll bet. Beth is watching from North Carolina. Doesn't sound as cool as down under, come to think of it. Yep. <laughs> uh, Faye is watching, says good day, international. Tanya is watching from cold Florida. Ginger, Ginger is back. I got too many mules. We'll come back and we'll get that question, Ginger. We're anxious to answer that for you. Rip is watching from Globe, cloudy but warm. Uh, Gary Green is watching from Tularosa. And it's going to be a good, good broadcast today. Thank you, Gary, for joining us. Uh, Wanted R1 is watching over on YouTube from Morrison, uh, Morristown, Arizona. Beautiful and 70. Agreed. Sally's watching from Central Illinois. Sunny and Toasty 36. And David is watching from Australia, 8 a.m. Thursday in Australia down under. So let's get to our first question. This one comes from Ginger. And the way this works, folks, is you put your questions in there, and I do my best to keep up with them, and uh, and we get to them one by one by one. And uh, if you have any follow-ups, uh, go ahead and put those in there as well. But, uh, Steve, I just got too many mules. They're siblings, and they're very skittish and very horse-like. I've put them out with my donkeys, what is the chance they will settle down and start being friendly like the other donks? Their donkeys or their mules? Uh, two mini mules. Put them the out mini. with my other donkeys. I'd like for That's them to a, calm right. down, settle down, and be friendly like the donks. I was thinking like she had two mini mules. 
Oh, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, and I, okay, mini mules. All right, so that's a different situation. I have two mini mules. All right, you can see how that would look. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, let's for one thing. How old are they? That's one thing because you know they grow physically and mentally until they're seven years old. And if they're gelding, sometimes you kind of wonder if they're ever going to grow up in some ways because they're really playful. But here's the thing. Many mules are usually bred to Shetland ponies. And Shetland ponies is usually not the greatest thing in the world to breed to with a mule. Um, with a mini mule, uh, you say it's settled down. What, what does that mean? Uh, you know, and another thing is, I wouldn't put them out in the pasture. That's me. You know, I don't put nothing out in the pasture. I take that back. I'll turn them out in a pasture at my place because there's choya cactus, and there's barrel cactus, and I want them to get the stickers in them without me on them, if you know what I mean. So I usually like to turn them out for that. But as far as turning out to feeding and stuff, especially with you all back east with that rich feed, it is really easy to founder donkeys. It's really easy to founder mules. That's called grass founder. So, uh, so give me an idea of what you mean by will they settle down? What what are you looking for in that? So what she had said was that they are very skittish and very horse like. Yeah. All right, all right, skittish. All right. So uh, let's go back to our feeding program. If you're feeding a lot of grass and it's really rich. Uh, that's going to make them bounce off the walls and, and yeah, they'll be silly for sure. Uh, but you need to folks, a feeding program is so important for the mental health of these mules, uh, feeding them the right feed, uh, makes all the difference in the world, uh, not only in their physical body, but the mental. So, uh, horse-like, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen some awful nice horses that were gentle and ready to go, but, and then. I've seen others of them that were flighty, but they were bred that way. And 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 usually Shetland ponies are are usually not bred all that well. And so if you've got those and they're over seven years old, then they're pretty pretty much going to be stuck with the way they are. There you go. Uh, all right, moving right along. We've got uh, Andrea watching from Altoona, Florida. I hope you're going to be able to join us out here, Andrea, for our clinic coming up in March. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, Linda is watching with Theo the Mule Sir, or is Linda the Mule Servant and Theo the Sweet One-Eyed Mule in frigid rural central Ohio. We've got Dee watching from Herod, Ohio. Snow and cold everywhere here. Yolanda, we've gone international. Yolanda is our unofficial Queen Valley Mule Ranch representative in the Netherlands. She's making sure that everybody there knows about Steve Edwards and how to treat the mule and the donkey. So we're glad to have you here today, Yolanda. No questions, no riding, only bad we weather, rain, wind, snow, ice, and even worse is coming this weekend. Well, button down the hatches, stay safe, and make sure your Spanish mule is taken care of, Yolanda. I know you're already on top of it. Uh, Rip says, will you be sending out times for upcoming clinics? So Rip, the only clinic we currently have scheduled is the one in March. And uh, I'll be, matter of fact, I'll just talk about that right now. Steve. What are we doing in yeah. March? Well, Rip's coming. He's actually on the list of people to come. Hey, all right. So, uh, yeah. So, you know, we'll be getting everybody qualified and certified about 8 o'clock in the morning. 9 o'clock, uh, things will start up. And we'll start talking about uh, each one of my participants. I want them to give me three things that they want me to help them with. So each one out of my, I've got uh, uh, 12 participants, so we're completely full with participants. And each one is going to give me three things that they, they would like some help with. So there you are, Rip, get things together. So we'll basically run till about uh, sometime around noon, between noon and one o'clock, we'll have lunch. It just depends on these mules because when we do this stuff, it's mule and donkey time. So I don't like to leave one in the middle of something when I'm working with them or a person. So we'll, we'll get that done. Um, I tell everybody, bring your helmets and bring your gloves. Gloves, very, very important. Helmet, super important. Uh, so make sure you get that done. 
and we'll usually end somewhere in that four to five o'clock range. It really depends there again. We were on a mule and donkey time. And then Sunday morning, we have Cowboy Church. And uh, we've got some great music coming up uh, with uh, the Broken Chair Band. And then uh, we've also got a special guest that will be here in from California. And um, she will be singing as well. And I'll, uh, she's, and she, she has helped me with Cowboy Churches in the past. And uh, her name is Julie. Uh, her and Mike will be coming. And she was in my very first uh, meal trainers clinic or meal training clinic at, at um, uh, Pierce College. No, it wasn't at Pierce College. This was actually at Bishop, California. Oh, okay. And then when we started the one at Pierce College, uh, she was also there as well. So, How about it? Yeah, she'd been married to Mike now five or six years. And uh, she is quite the dog trainer. She was the one to give me Jess. So fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. folks, yeah, if you're if you're not if you're not picking up on it, these events are a lot of fun, and it truly is an experience. It's not just come, watch, leave, but it is come and experience. It is come and see see it done right, but not just right refine. And that is the difference between what you are able. It's fantastic what you're able to do uh, at home, watching the video, go out and play it. And we want you to do that. But when you are ready to take that next step or, or you really just want to build upon what you've already learned, that's when you come out and you really get a chance to experience refined communication. And uh, it really is, it is, is an awesome thing. And if you can't make it this time, we will have things in the future. Rip, whenever we do have something, we will put it out and we'll make sure folks on Steve's email newsletter know about it first. So uh, participants are all taken up, but there are plenty of spectator spots. I told y'all last week, I said those participant spots are going to get taken up real quick. Sure enough, they did. There are plenty of spectator spots left and we would love to meet you. We would love to see you and have you here. So there you go. Floyd is watching from Canton, Texas, 68 degrees and sunny. Ashley is watching from 57 and sunny North Central Arkansas. We've got Beth. Any chance you would offer your clinic live stream that we can purchase access to like Mule Pay-Per-View? <laughs> yes, we are going to be recording it. And I'm not exactly sure what the plans for the recording are going to be. We're still formulating that. But we will make sure that everybody, and Beth, as long as you are receiving Steve emails, everybody knows exactly what they need to do to get their hands on the Mule Pay-Per-View. I like that. I think I'm going to make a note of that for the future. Mule Pay-Per-View. Uh, around the seams. Hello, Ron from Ohio here. New Mule owner. Just talked with Steve. He was checking on my order. Thanks. Everything is good. And saddle breaching and breast collar look fantastic. That's what we like to hear. Uh, Ginger coming back with her, uh, her mini question. Well, dang. Shetland mules. So little devils, huh? They're 8 to 10 years old, and I follow Steve's protocol protocols on feeding all of them. They are on dry lots, but they are large enough that it's difficult to catch them. Any follow-ups there, Steve, since she's just chiming back in? Yeah, well, when, when they're difficult to catch, put them in a small pen. Uh, I like to have all of my mules, my donkeys, in separate pens. Each one has its own pen. 10 foot wide, 20 foot long is what I use. That way you can change their minds. But when it comes down to these little, like you said, little devils. Now, I've had some pretty good little Shetland mules, but it took a world bunch of training to train on them. And I trained them to drive and actually used them at kids' camp. But it did take me quite a bit of time to get their heads together. Uh, yep, sure did. Yep. They can be buggers. Uh, first question that we've got emailed in, this one comes from Tanya. Tanya says, uh, I... Uh, Let's see. My first mule arrived yesterday. She's a sweetheart, but will definitely benefit from groundwork. I will ground drive her for a while before hooking up. Uh, she does drive, but needs a tune-up. I was wondering, how much can she pull? And should I start with an easy entry cart, or could I go ahead and get a small wagon? Also, can the halter I ordered be made small enough for her? Again, want to thank you for the informative videos. I will attach a couple pictures so you can see what size I'm talking about. Um, what would you say there? Can starting to drive here? Can she pull a regular wagon, or does she need a little cart? And can your halter be adjusted to fit smaller heads? You bet. Yeah, I 
I talked to Tanya Monday, I think it was, and uh, told her I can adjust the halter down to feed a, fit a mosquito. And uh, and so she she was, you know, she said, good. And I, I even did a little bit of pre-adjusting on it for her because her little mule does have a small head. So is easy entry cart. That basically means you're going to get in from the side. It's a two-wheel cart with shafts, and usually uh, one to two people are on it, or sometimes a, a grandpa with two grandkids on it, too. Uh, they're, they're very nice to, to drive and this sort of thing. Can, can that little mule do a four-passenger? Yes, you know, on fairly decent ground, it's where you've got to pull a lot of heavy steel heels. That's kind of tough. But, you know, arena driving, driving on good flat roads, not so bad at all. So, yep, she's, we, we got the halters. We adjusted them down and, uh, and sent them to her, and she's fixed. She's in good shape. Awesome. Love it. Uh, Anna sent a message in. Uh, she says, uh, I'm, let's see. Uh, bo -bo 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 -bo. Oh, where's the question? Okay, question. She got two questions. Question one, and Anne is coming out uh, for the uh, the event as well. She says, uh, "Yes, uh, let's see. Um, when I got my mule a few months ago, my mule was notorious for being hard to catch. That is much better, and I can almost always catch her within a minute now. But my mule acts skittish sometimes on the ground and kind of pulls back away. If I can't hang on, she gets away, doesn't go far, and usually." Uh, can pick up the lead rope shortly thereafter. But this is really bad thing. And if she got away, a big problem here. It sounds like the come along rope would work. What would you say? Uh, I told her, yes, the come along rope would work. How would you instruct her to use that come along rope? Well, that was one thing about my suggestion with the majority of folks when they buy just the come along rope, then all of a sudden they, they're thinking it's going to just do magical things. I have a, a kit and it's uh, it works good. It has uh, it's called a ground foundation kit, and it has the video. It has the come along rope, and it has the adjustable halter. And then that way you can use it. When one has learned to pull away, they've usually had nylon halters to start with, and uh, and then that teaches them to brace. Or people pull on them a lot, folks. That's the worst thing you can do with any mule or donkey is to pull on them. When you start pulling on them, they will start pulling back, you know. Now, I don't mind just a little, you know, little steady, easy pull, but if I go to pick up and I go to pull and they don't want to come, I don't pull more, I bump, 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 just like with the bridle. When I ask them to go and I don't pull more, I go bump, bump, bump. So, you know, once you kind of come to the end of the string and you feel them tight, don't pull more, bump more. Awesome. Very good. Um, let's continue on here. Uh, we got more folks joining in, watching. Um, uh, actually, Linda has a question, so we'll get to your question here, Linda. Considering what you said about Shetland mini mules, do different horse donkey crosses have distinctive tipperments and behaviors from one another? For instance, Theo is a quarter horse mammoth jack cross. I've also seen a Tennessee walking horse mules, but I don't know what type of donkey you cross to make those. So temperaments, are there different temperaments based upon these crosses? Well, you know, usually that's the biggest thing that I look for in any mule is is get that disposition number one first. It, it. it just happens to be that Shetland ponies have always had uh, a predisposition of being uh, just hard to deal with. Uh, uh, I remember when they first come out years ago, everybody thought it was great. We got a kid's donkey or a kid's uh, Shetland pony. And no, it ended up hurting a lot of kids. But, but no, for the most part, you know, all these horses, you got to remember this, folks, that when you are breeding or when you're looking for a mule, you know, if they are bred quarter horse, what's a quarter horse? It can be a racing animal or it can be a cowie animal. So in that case, uh, they're meant for work. Uh, and a lot of times they're not balanced and framed up. Their head is elevated and or they have too high of a hip 
and the downhill hip. So they, that can be, so it's going to be more of a, of a, of a confirmation thing than this disposition. Now, it can be disposition wise that some of these quarter type horses also are pretty good at wanting to buck, you know. So that's the other thing. When you are breeding, you want to think you don't want to breed to a horse that's uh, been really bad about bucking, you know. Uh, and there are some breeds that they use for just for bucking horses. But basically, just look for disposition. I, I, I don't know of any quarter horse, fox trotters, or anything that you could say that's the best one to breed to. Uh, I had some awful good mules that were... Fox trotters, Tennessee walkers, quarter horses, a little bit of everything. And uh, disposition is number one priority. There you go. Uh, okay, let's continue on here. Uh, Eric is watching, and Eric says, "How do mules? How do mules do on a mountain slope pasture with a few benched out areas?" Commenting from Northern New Mexico, how do they do on these uh, slope pastures with a few benched out areas? Well, they usually do just fine. That's it's really good that you've got that type of quote pasture. It gives them exercise, you know. Uh, uh, Randy and I were just talking down at the Andrada Ranch this morning that they've got a they've got uh, what's almost 600 acres of pasture. Now <laughs> there's not much pasture out there, not much feed because we're dry. But even when the feed's good. It's not all that good, and, and Randy still has to give um, hay to supplement it. But the good thing about it, about a big pasture like that, is they do get exercise instead of just setting. So if I got to say there's a, a good pasture, it would be the one that would be on the slope of a mountain or where there's a lot of washes or draws and that sort of thing, then they'll get exercise. But you got to remember those ranch animals, they get used all the time. I mean, they're not setting around. They they get used. So when they're brought in, that's when they're fed. Uh, but otherwise, you know, they'll be out there on those big pastures all together. You know, Randy has like 30, 30 some odd heads, something like that there. Yeah. Uh, great question. Thanks, Eric. Glenn is watching from Louisville, uh, Louisville um, Missouri. Uh, and then uh, just something to emphasize, folks. I put a link in the comment section. If you're watching for the first time, when Steve's talking, if he references a product or an article or a video on YouTube or or something, I do my best to go on the internet, find it real quick, and put that in the comment section so you can access it. So if you're looking in the comment section right now, you're going to see something from us that says Ground Foundation Starting Kit. Um, we don't, we really don't do a whole lot of telling people you need to buy this. We'll give you all the information. We say this is why it's going to make things better or this is how it's going to help you gain trust, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to the Ground Foundation starting kit, we care too much about you, your safety, and your communication to just say, eh, you can take it or leave it. You need the Ground Foundation starting kit. We are going to talk about that every single week. Matter of fact, last week we talked about it and I asked folks, if you've got a Ground Foundation starting kit, put in the comment section what a difference made. It has made, and we had probably about seven to 10 comments right off the bat of folks saying it has worked wonders. So if you're watching and you think you can get away with just the come along rope or just the rope halter, I'm going to say, no, 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 no. Get the entire ground foundation starting kit and you can be in the driver's seat, so to speak, and actually implement a lot of the stuff that we're talking about. So just wanted to mention that there. Uh, Jock is watching from Prescott, Arizona, 62 and windy and muddy. Good to have you here, Jock. Uh, Wayne is watching from Alabama. Uh, Beth says, I was always told Shetlands are Satan's ca <laughs> Satan's Calvary. Uh, giddy up. Uh, let's see. Linda says, thank you. Roger is watching from L Milan, New York. Ben is watching over on YouTube from Prince George, British Columbia, negative 10 degrees and cloudy. Good to have you here, Ben. Glenn is watching on, uh, Facebook out from Mississippi. Far, uh, Farrah's over on Facebook in Herman, jo uh, Herman, Utah. And Trisha is watching from Wasilla, Alaska. Mushed my sled dogs this morning, and now it's donkey time. That is a good day if I've ever heard it. The next question we got, Steve, uh, I talked to you about this before uh, the clinic started, um, and I just said, hey, I just 
I, I want to put this out there, give you a chance to think about it. Um, because Ruth emailed in with some concerns. She says, I was recently at an auction and I saw someone twisting a mule's ear so that someone else could draw blood for a Coggins test. I happen to own a mule that is ear shy because of this barbaric practice. You have a huge following and the ability to put out a short video about other ways to maintain control of a mule or donkey rather than make them head shy or hard to halter or bridle for the rest of their lives. I think this is just as important as tack that fits appropriately. Uh, Steve, let's talk about this. Uh, drawing blood from the ear, twisting it up to get uh, a sample for a Coggins test. Yeah, that's okay. So it's called earing down. It's been a practice that cowboys have done, and even probably even back in Jesus' days, as far as I, I don't know for sure, but it's been a practice that's been used. What you do is you basically keep their attention off of that needle going into the jugular for a, 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 a blood draw, okay? And basically you get a hold of the ear, and you, I usually get a hold of the ear, put it in my mouth, hold on to it, and then take the bottom jaw and turn it up. And then that way I got control of them, and I, we could pretty much do anything you want. Uh, folks, that, that doesn't, that's not really the biggest problem that we have that's creating ear shape or shy, shy problems. Can it be one of them? Yes. Uh, that practice is not practiced very much of earing them down. Uh, I'm surprised you even was able to see it someplace because very few people do that these days. Uh, where usually you have an ear shy problem is because people have used a horse bridle that doesn't have a 19 inch brow band. People are using horse bridle or they're using bridles, even my bridles, and are putting them on and off the same way every single day. Don't do that, folks. If you want to create problems, with the mule's ears, then go and, and put the bridle on the same way every day. Here's how you get around it. You loosen up the bridle where the bit's coming down. The mule feels the bit coming down. They'll drop their head so that they can take the bridle off nice and smooth. Then when you put it on, you want the head to be down, nose tip to the left. Take your middle finger, rub it in the bars of the mouth, Slide the bit up nice and easy, right ear first, left ear second, okay? And, and you can put your bridle on that way. And then let the mule pick up the bit and pack it so that you know where to put it. But here's the problem. You talk about barbaric, and yes, I understand that. But to me, it's barbaric to put a bridle on incorrect, or what I really feel is really barbaric, is when you have a snap that goes on behind the ears. Why not fix the problem? Fix the problem, you know? Easy to fix, uh, it, it really is. And, and unfortunately, that person that did the earring down is still living back, you know, five centuries back, I guess. I don't know. And, and Back in the yeah. day, they're still back in the day. They're still back in the day. Yes, did I do that? Oh yeah, I done it a lot, uh, and and but I found better ways. I mean, I I you know, does it work? Oh man, let me tell you, if I'm back in the mountains and I got to help a mule out and I've got to ear him down to do it, I'll do it in a minute. I'll get that ear and I'll bite onto it. I'll turn the head. You can completely control that mule. I mean, it's amazing how control. But where the big problem is, why we have ear shy mules. It's because we're using, we're, we're putting the bridle on pre-adjusted every day. Don't do that. Always loosen it up, take it off, put it on loose, let the mule pick up the bit and pack it. That's number one. Number two, the brow band is not 19 inches. So the piece that goes across the front needs to be at least 19 inches to work on the average mule, even some of the draft mules. Okay. And then here's the third part. And this is really important. You're using most likely a horse bit in a mule's mouth. You have a completely different palate. And so that's that's important. Is so do we have a video out? Yes, we do. You bet. We got a video and and, and it works beautifully. You can see me using a humane twitch. 
you will see me using that uh, in my clinic uh, um, in March. You will see me put a meal to sleep. You'll see me, if, if I still had some of my old meals, if I even hold that twitch up, they put their nose into it. You know, it, it does no harm to them. In all actuality, the ear shy thing, biting them down, I've had a lot of my mules that I've had to, to bite down the ear over the years, and I never had an ear shy problem. You know, the ear shy problem comes from not, from putting on a pre-adjusted bit, okay, is the biggest problem. So there you are. That's good. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Uh, next question we got, this one comes in from Bryce. Uh, Bryce asks, me and the wife just started looking to buy a mule and wanted to talk to you about what the going rate is for a mule. Now, I sent him a link to the article, buying a mule on Craigslist or at auction, but I figured it'd be a good opportunity for us to talk as well. What's the going rate for a mule, Steve? Uh, whatever your pocketbook can handle. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I've seen mules go upwards of fifty, sixty thousand dollars, and and um, anyway, that's another whole story. Here's here's what you really want to look at, and this is really important. Number one, when you look to buy a mule and you're looking at the picture, if there's no breaching and no rear cinch, there's no buying that mule. Why is that? Because the breaching keeps the saddle back. I was just talking to a lady today that she had a mule let to a trainer, a very well-known good trainer, and brought the mule home, and she was using uh, a treeless saddle, which is another whole story, without a breaching. So she said, I'm just gonna try it out. She ended up hitting the ground. The mule plumb bucked her off. And why is that? Number one, a breaching is what holds the saddle back. Flat ground or hilly mountains, it's imperative you have a breaching. Number two, that rear cinch. That rear cinch has to hold the saddle in place and be solid and the front cinch be loose. Here's the problem, the major problem with a treeless saddle, and that is there are no bars to evenly distribute your weight across that animal's back. Now think about this, where your cinches are, where your front cinch goes is right at the pummel, the front part of the saddle. So you're taking that pummel and you're pushing down upon that mule's uh, uh, muscles and tendons and this sort of thing right in behind the scapula and you are restricting that area from moving around. So you put your saddle on, it pushes on that area, it restricts it, and it starts doing damage. It'll start first with white hairs, and then it'll go from there and start causing a lot of other problems. So that front cinch, and then if you had bars on a tree, that would evenly distribute your weight, and you don't. So going back, if you're looking at a mule, you're looking at a mule to buy, you look at the pictures first, all right? The pictures say, no breaching, no rear cinch, no buy the mule. All right, now the next thing is, it's, it's been all over Colorado and packed in the hills, yada, yada. That don't make any difference. You wanna impress me? You wanna show me the mule is trained in a 10 foot circle, side pass, turn on the forehand, turn on the hindquarters. That right there shows me the mule is trained. Going through water, are going through, <clears throat> down going down roads with a bunch of traffic and stuff, doesn't show me training, it shows me disposition, okay? If they can handle a car or a truck going by them, that shows me that's a willing disposition. If they, if they can walk across the stream and this sort of thing, that shows me willing disposition, okay? But just because they're 12 years old and they've been there, done that, that don't mean nothing. You buy disposition first, you buy confirmation second, you buy training third, and all the color and everything like that comes afterwards, okay? Uh, so there you are. Uh, there's not really an average price. I'm gonna tell you, and folks, here it is. The majority of meals out there are over, over, overpriced. 
Now, when I trained on a mule and I sold it, this was 25 years ago, I sold that mule for $3,500. That's when that mule, once when you could buy mules for $500 or $1,000. But I trained on that mule for six months to a year. Now, would you work all year for $3,500 plus buy the mule, plus feed the mule, plus vet the mule, plus take care of the mule on top of that? So you think about even $10,000 on a mule, okay, and you for a year, that's not much money for, for a year. You know, uh, I don't know very many people that could afford to, to, be, to do that. So anyway, long story short, it's going to be what your pocketbook's going to, it's not going to, your po- the price of the mule does not dictate how good the mule is. Yeah, that's, that's well said. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, disposition first, confirmation second, training third, training third, and then color and all the other stuff fourth. And I've heard you say, Steve, when you get those out of order, that's when you get a butt mule. My yeah. mule has ridden all up and down the Grand Canyon, gone in and out of you know the Colorado mountains or whatever, but my mule has spent X number of hours, you know, traveling here or there, but so, uh, so this is a great question. And I, I love what you said there at the end, the amount of money does not dictate the amount of training that that mule has. I think that's great. Um, you talked about the scapula. Uh, we had a question in here. I think it was from Floyd, uh, said, is a scapula problem fixable? The majority of the time, no. I don't know of anybody that's been able to fix the scapula. That would take some major surgery and cleaning and this sort of thing. Uh, you know, the one that we have where the vet give us their, his statement about the little color flower on it, on the scapula, no. It's usually not fixable. It's usually that fiber is cracked or it's usually got a place started. It's kind of like having arthritis unless they go in there and clean it out and, and replace it with some other parts. You know, but of course that's not going to happen. So is a scapula fixable? No. Are there things that we can do to compensate for one that may have a sore scapula? Not really, Dave, uh, other than just a lot of rest. If it was me and I did the x-rays on it and, and he says it's basically muscles in and around the scapula and tendons and this sort of thing, with uh, six to eight months of rest, maybe he'll come back. But it's when the scapula is actually damaged, there's there's no coming back. He either has to be a, a pastor ornament or you have to have him put down. Very good. That's why we're here. Make sure people have the information that they need so uh, it doesn't get to that issue. So thank you. Good question, Floyd. Uh, Kelsey asked the question, can I put a two-eared bridle on my mule. So number one, what is a two-eared bridle, Steve? And number two, can I put it on my mule? Two-eared bridle means it's a strap that goes around each ear. So it goes around this ear, then there's another one that goes around this ear, rather than one that comes across the front, all right? The two-eared bridle is a pester to a mule. They don't like it. They will be moving their ears stiff and not be happy. Uh, a one-ear bridle or a two-ear bridle just makes mules super uncomfortable, and they will get cranky as time goes by. Now, get this in your mind, folks. At, time and time again, I've had people say to me, well, you know, I put it on, it worked, but then five days later, I put it on, it wouldn't work anymore. Well, the mule had enough, you know, so don't, don't think because you've done it two or three times that it's going to be fine. No, it's it's several years down the trail where it makes a difference, you know. Uh, next question we've got here. This one, uh, this one's a follow up. Megan emailed us last week. I'll read the original and then I'll read the follow up. Um, so we talked about it last week. Got a couple questions for you. Seven year old gelded donkey that I've had going for two years. I suspect he was mishandled, possibly hit by a previous owner. Um, he's got trusting issue. Uh, do your technique works with damaged or rescued mules, bumping his nose, etc.? Secondly, do you have tips on how to get a nervous donkey to take oral meds, warmers, hates when things taste bad, won't let me near his face, etc.? So uh, the follow-up, uh, you talked about that, and basically it was like, hey, uh, do what you need to do to be in control, and when you get it to communicate, and when you get it down, you won't have to do hardly anything. You'll just that. 
So follow ground foundation training uh, that you learn in the foundation toolkit with the problem mule video. Here's the follow up. Got it. Sounds like I need to totally change my approach. I'm a new donkey owner and most other info I've come across says donkeys aren't stubborn, but they're cautious. So give them a few minutes to decide if they feel safe with the situation you're putting them in. This is much different than Steve's approach of ask, tell, and demand. Is there any situation where giving them time is appropriate? No, not really. You know, ask, tell, demand, folks, is natural. You know, it's what a herd leader does. You'll see a herd leader, she'll pin her ear, she'll ask him not to do it, she'll pin her ear, she'll switch her tail, she'll tell him not to do it, and then she'll spin and kick, you know? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, when it comes down to these animals, folks, you can't pet them, they're not a dog. You can't pet them into submission. And you do have to sometimes get a little harsher than what most people would like to do, like the bumping, you know. The bumping is a wonderful tool. You're going to see me using it at the clinic this uh, this next month. I've got a lot of videos on it of animals that are just huge. Um, I've got some video, Dave, of uh, that, that one of my clients just sent me of me training Pertron mules, 18 high-hand Pertron mules, in Minnesota for the Minnesota Zoo, and I was using the come along hitch. You know, uh, it, it giving them time is not going to work. All it's going to do is they'll find another way to get around you. Uh, the ask, tell, demand it works, it's consistent, and it is the natural way of doing things. Very good. Uh, Cindy's watching presently in Arizona, enjoying your 75 degree weather, riding our mules in lovely Rio Rancho Verde. Cindy, it's good to have you here. Thanks for hanging out. Linda made a comment here on the uh, cost for a mule. Two years ago in Kentucky, I paid $3,000 for Theo, the sweet one-eyed mule. He was nine years old, broke to ride in good health and vet checked. He is missing his left eye since a baby. And she, Theo has the best caretaker in the entire world. Somebody yeah. who has dubbed herself as Linda, the mule servant. I don't think it can get much better for sweet Theo. So very yeah. good there, Linda. Thanks for sharing. Tony says, ear shy female mule who is 15 years old. I don't believe she's ever been bridled. She had pink eyes. I have worked with her to get a UV face mask on her. She is improving. Could it be her eyesight? In your experience, do pink-eyed mules have blindness issues? Yes, they do. Pink-eyed mules, yes, have blindness issues, have problems with getting sunburned, uh, have problems with cancer, and this sort of thing. It's uh, A pink-eyed animal is a lot of work for a, an owner. And yes, a mask is the absolute best way to do it. Now, uh, my uh, video and my humane twitch is what's going to help you through that. Do the steps I show in that video. You'll see a mule that we're trying to doctor with its eye, and you'll see it throw in its head. And when you see a 300-pound head hit a person, it doesn't feel good, okay? But you'll see me using the twitch, You'll see, even in a picture on the front of the cover, you see the mule's almost asleep, you know? And that, folks, really works. If you've got an ear shy mule that you're having problems with bridling or putting the mask on or, or vetting or anything, I, every mule that I train on, every donkey I train on, I teach them to twitch. There we go. Uh, next question. This one comes in from Ben. Ben's watching on YouTube. It says, hello, Dave and Steve. Just a quick question about your saddles. I've sat in a 17-inch horse saddle, and they have been too small for me. My question is, do you make larger saddles, say an 18-inch or a 19-inch, Steve? Okay. I, I don't make over a 17-inch saddle, and the biggest reason is that I want my mules to be comfortable and not not be uncomfortable so uh the problem with the 17 inch with a, going into an 18 inch saddle you start getting into the kidney area now yes the kidneys hang you know and there's muscles there so the 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 bars uh will pound on those muscles and create problems for your meals so 
what I usually tell people, now you got to remember, the majority of saddles out there are made for arena riding, low cannels, and this sort of thing. So usually my, my big riders, my big mule riders, I'll put them in what's called the rancher saddle. And that rancher saddle will give you more thigh size. Folks, it's not your rump uh, that dictates the size of the saddle you should be setting in. It's your thigh size. And we have a lot of videos. Matter of fact, the saddle, it's free. Uh, the how to master your, your saddle, or I forget how we named that. Mule day. saddle training course. But Mule I like saddle. it. Mastering yeah. your mastering your saddle fit. I like that. That's good. I, th I think it says something like that. On oh, the you know what? It does on the new website. It does. Mastering. It's uh, yeah. uh, oh, let me bring it up here. It is good. Um, mastering the saddle. Discover how to keep your mule comfortable on the trail and experience the best riding of your life. Yeah, that right there, folks. It's free. That's going to give you tons of information and. You know, if you need to know about things like that, it'll it'll help you out. You can also call me as well, but all the information we've got there will help you out. But that's why I stay away from anything larger than a 17. I, I care more about how the animal is going to end up in the future, you know. So that's that'd be my suggestion. One of the things that I just learned last year, Steve and I have known each other for well over a decade now. Matter of fact, back all about about 15 years now. Um, one of the things I just learned this year was that the traditional uh, quarter horse saddle, what what is it, like 24-inch bars, Steve? Yeah. 24-inch yeah. bars. So that quarter horse saddle is built on a 24-inch bar, and that spans the length of the back of the animal. Steve's bars are 19 and a half inches. Yep. Steve's bars are 19 and a half inches, which means it spans a shorter range on the back of the animal, which means number one, it's avoiding the scapula on the front when you position it correctly, while it's also not sitting on top of the kidneys on the back. So you put a uh, semi-quarter okay. horse saddle up on top of the back of a mule, whether it's to accommodate a larger seat or otherwise, now all of a sudden you've got it on the scapula and you've got it touching the back of the kidneys. Yep. Two no-nos, two things that that'll... Uh, wreck your mule um, with the kidneys. What'd you say? It'll it, it it'll come down. It'll damage the kidneys and develop aceteria. Is that what it is? Yeah, aceteria because it's constantly pounding on that muscle area, and then the kidneys, them, you know, they're running all the urine and this sort of thing. Yeah, uh, through cleaning, and they end up getting it ends up being dark, and you end up having coffee looking color. And the, the mule dies of absenteria and it's ugly. So when Steve talks about, you know, when you make a, a, a this is all new to me and it's, it's coming together. But when he's talking about when you start making a bigger saddle seat, you talk about having to extend, extend the length of the saddle. And now you're getting into the point where it's going to be touching the scapula, touching the kidneys, and that's going to be an issue. So that was just a yeah. really huge learning moment for me. Um, and, uh, really brought a lot of things together. So I, I just wanted to share what I had learned there. Hopefully it'll help, help it come together for some more folks. Uh, Kelsey says, I got my first mule last week as a two year old. I have two horses that have been around equine, um, uh, five years and, and am now 25. Um, how do I start my young mule? I am working on ground manners, but where do I start with the saddle? Well, again, that uh, mastering the saddle fit, that would be really good for you. That would answer tons of questions. You don't have to worry about measurements and stuff. Uh, the saddle makers that use uh, these uh, get measurements, and then they use these saddle things to go on their back to make a decision how the saddle is going to fit. Uh, they don't know how a mule goes. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to, even like today, where they've had uh, a saddle fitter come out and put on this this machine that shows how it should be touched and it should be you know certain des designs and this sort of thing well that's you know you do that now in january you do that in july you're going to have two different measurements folks so i don't go by measurements i go by 40 years of been using these things 
and Steve, it's proof. not even just January to July. It's the start of a ride and four hours later of your ride. You can drop. Yeah. How much How much weight can a mule drop on a four or five hour ride? Well, four or five hour ride, they could drop, you know, 25, 30 pounds. On a weekend ride, they can drop 100 pounds pretty easy. And your measurements so, are off at that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I, I, you know, it's for me, it's been years on, in, in, on the side of a mountain. You know, that's what that's how my trees have proved out. And Dave, that's another reason I tell I just telling a lady earlier that my trees are my trees. My saddle right. is my saddle. I don't have a mule saddle. I've got a Steve Edwards saddle and they're completely different, you know. Yeah. Uh, Kelsey, so in addition to what Steve's talking about here, if you don't have the come along rope, if you don't have the rope halter and if you have not watched the problem mule video building a new foundation, you're going to want to get that because the thing that uh, that I've watched and I've seen Steve teach so many people, if you can't control on the ground, if you're not the herd leader on the ground, you shouldn't be in the saddle because you're not going to be the herd leader in the saddle. And, and, and that's where, that's where problems start to go. Uh, so I'll put a link in the comment section. Great question, Kelsey. Uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, Jock, uh, says, uh, just wanted to let you know that Annie, my auction mule from Bo Bowie livestock auction is doing great. Just received your martingale and put it on her. She's doing very well. Thank you so much. We love hearing that. That's fantastic. Um, Ben, uh, who asked the question about the saddle size, he says, perfect. Thank you very much. Yolanda says, so I am lucky with my 17 inch cowboy saddle, despite the hard seat. So, uh, Yolanda is one of our longtime watchers and we've got ongoing back and forth, back and forth. We love you, Yolanda. We're glad that you're here. Uh, okay, Steve, last week we had a question come in from Kais and he was asking about your Minnesota video. He watched a video on Minnesota and I messaged him back. I, I didn't understand his question. And I'm just going to be honest with folks. Like I don't understand everything about equine. So I was like, okay, I think Steve answer it. He goes, no, he's like, I'd like to hear him. He, he goes, he talked about a lot of things, but I really want to know the answer to this. So I said, okay, what exactly do you want me to ask Steve? Cause I don't know the video. He says, ask him about the fact to train bulls like Steve does with mules and horses have them take a halter to lead them. These bulls have never had anything around their neck or faces and they are being free since birth. They are five years old now, set in their ways. Um, will the same principles go for the bulls? Um, uh, so there you go, Steve. I still don't understand the question, but do you understand what he's asking? Yeah, yeah. He, okay. he basically wants to halter train his cattle, his bull. And five years old is too late to figure that out. That bull going to weigh 20... 2100 pounds pretty easy depending on the type of bull usually when you when you're training a calf for halter uh halter sh showing that's what it amounts to uh, uh you you need to start that back when they're babies you know when you're first getting them weaned and this sort of thing that's the time to do it but a five-year-old bull no you know when i when i've got a, a, a rope around a five-year-old bull i'm tying him to a tree and I usually have a rope on the back legs and I usually have rope around the neck trying to choke him down a little bit and then tie him to a tree so I can doctor him uh, or get him to a shoot. But it's five years old, it's too late. You ain't going to be able to get that mule, I mean that that bull to be halter trained. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate that. Linda's got a question. My Steve Edwards saddle is so comfortable for me. Can I put it on a horse? Can I put a Steve Edwards saddle on a horse? No. No, you've got a completely different back, completely different bone structure. And what's going to happen is, is that saddle is going to bridge on that horse. Now, I'll just tell you a little story. I had a, a horse trainer contact me in, in Utah and bought one of my saddles because he started riding a lot of mules. And uh, he said, how about putting that saddle on a horse? I said, don't do it. You'll, you'll get yourself hurt. And boy, he called me two or three times and said, man, I've been riding your saddle on his horses. Been working really good. I said, okay. Well, one day he called me up from the ER with a broken pelvis. No, a collarbone. And the, the horse had had enough. He'd ridden him half a dozen times in that saddle and he put it on and the horse was jumping around. So he just uh, waited for a minute for him to get quiet, 
climbed on that horse and that horse flat bucked him off, you know? So no, don't put my saddle on any horses. I don't want to get a phone call from the ER. Yeah. And it's the same reason why you don't want to put a horse saddle on a mule. They were made completely different. And one of the things that I've seen rise up and I see this because I'm on YouTube and Facebook and I see the comments. Steve, you've experienced this your whole life as a cowboy, but folks will, folks will look at, at, at the book and they'll look at the cover and they'll say, oh, I don't like that cover. I don't like the way that cover looks. I don't like the way, I don't like what I see on that cover when it comes to how to train a mule or a donkey, how to train equine. What they don't do is open up the book and understand that inside that book, is everything that God put inside of these animals. And it's completely different than a dog. It's completely different than a cat. It's different than an alligator. It's different than a bird. They are created unique and 100% different than some of these domesticated animals that we have living inside with us. Um, Steve, you talked a little bit earlier. You said you want to know something about what I think is barbaric. You said using snaps. You said using a nylon halter. Talk to me a little bit about um, how this how this, how, why that, cause that's just nothing, just a little snap right there. Just a nylon halter. That's not going to do anything, yeah. man. You're going in there. Bump, 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 man. You're, you're ruining that animal. It should be never allowed. Why are you saying a snap is barbaric and bump, bump, bump is just communicating. All right. So let me, let me go back to this. What people do rather than pull the ears through a brow band is they have a strap that comes along the back behind the ears and then they snap it into place okay and so they they're thinking they're doing the the mule good by not having to pull the ears through there listen them ears are yours you paid for them and i have had every size of mule you can imagine and i have always put all their ears inside that bridle always have I prefer to fix the problem rather than going around the problem. And when you're taking that bridle and you're coming behind the ears and snapping into place, yes, you're getting the bridle on, but you're fooling yourself and you're going to have future problems. Okay. Cause here's the deal. When they throw their head, what's, what is that? Fright and then they create flight. So they're frightened because you just pull up on the mouth trying to get the vid on, so they're frightened, and then they throw their head flight. Here's the next thing that happens. After a bit, when they can't do it any other way, they'll take off running. Or I've seen them paw with their front feet. You know, uh, I've seen them hurt people, you know. So why not fix the problem before it comes? Just all you did was bandage it. So I don't, I don't do that. The other thing was nylon. Nylon, when it comes down to nylon halters, does nothing but teach a mule to brace, okay? You don't use nylon halters on a mule, you create problems. And especially, don't keep your halters on your mules when they're out in big pastures or in a corral. I have seen one awful wreck where a horse, a horse got his halter hung up on a T post and it put his eye out cut up some bad places on the side of the jaw because he was hung up. He was trying to, to scratch on that T-post and it hurt him pretty bad. So don't do that. And then last but not least, a snap on the bottom. A snap as, it, as it's moving, a big heavy bull snap, ends up creating a lot of pressure and the animal will get tired of it. Mules care more about their nose into their mouth. And as that pressure from that snap rolling back and forth puts pressure on them, they're done. Very good. All right. We are uh, rounding third and crossing into home plate here, getting ready to have a uh, photo finish at the plate, see what the umpire says. We're going to be safe. Uh, but before before that happens, uh, just a couple more comments that we want to read through here. Um, uh, Cowboy Ken is watching from uh, Connecticut. Good to have you here. Uh Let's see. Yolanda says, Kelsey, trust Steve on his saddles. It took me three years to get one because I had to save up for a long time. I live in Europe and the transport fee is very expensive. And my mule is not even quarter horse paint, Appalachian, Tennessee walk app, Tennessee walking horse, uh, whatever U.S. breed, uh, purebred Spanish. 
uh, and his saddle fits with all that comes to it. So there you go. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Uh, Linda says, okay, fine. Good to know since we have a couple horses. Yep, your horses are going to thank you for using a horse saddle. And we know Theo is already in love with the mule saddle, with the Steve Edwards saddle. Uh, let's see here. David Pingelli is watching and says, Steve Edwards, I want to supply coffee for your March clinic. So there we go. We will be serving come along coffee at the clinic up here in March. Matter of fact, that's going to be a great way uh, to round out today's um, today's uh, uh, live stream. Uh, first weekend in March, Steve is hosting, Steve and Susan on the ranch at Queen Valley Mule Ranch are hosting a live in-person clinic. We're going to be outdoors. There's going to be plenty of space. Uh, you can stick your arms out, make sure you're socially distancing to your uh, preferred distance, uh, open air. It's going to be gorgeous in Arizona in March. Uh, you can stay at the Best Western in Gold Canyon, a fantastic area. Uh, it's just going to be an amazing, uh, amazing event. So if you are not signed up, all the participant spots are gone. I told you all last week they'd be gone. Here they are today, gone. But there are spectator spots. And uh, Steve, what did you say you're going to ask each participant that's going to kind of set the tone for the, the clinic? What are we going to be focusing on? What I'm going to do, and I'll actually be calling them all pretty soon here and, and ask them to put together three questions for me. Three things they want me to help me with. You know, they want me to help them with. You know, just make a difference what it is. And folks, when it comes to these mules, I don't have people bring them to me and let me fix them first and then show you all. Gee, look how good Steve Edwards is. No, you're going to see the actual problems. You're going to see the actual things and how I fix it. My suggestions to do it. Now, the first day, we're going to start building a foundation. The second day, Sunday, after Cowboy Church, you're going to start seeing the rider and the mule start to come together or the rider and the donkey. So it's, it's going to be pretty awesome. So I want three things from each participant that says, I need help with these three things. There you go, folks. So get signed up. I just put a link in the comment section. Uh, it's very affordable and the experience is going to be priceless. I, I promise you that. Uh, I've been at the last several and talking with folks at the end, they're just ecstatic about not only what they learned, but also what they got to experience. And I'd love for that to be you too. Uh, Andrea says, I've never used a snap over bridle that is now that is now for sale and will use the money to get Steve's bridle. Thank you for the information. Uh, Yolanda says, you're welcome, Dave. Appreciate that. Yolanda also says, Steve, I'm still saving up for the Spurs. And Jock says, I'm already signed up to come and watch. Very excited. I know I will learn so much. Jock, it's so good to have you. Uh, we are excited for anybody else that wants to come, but right now I want to say thank you to everyone for hanging out with us on our live stream clinic every single Wednesday. Uh, come and hang out with us next week. It would be really good to have you back. And, uh, Denise would love to have you come and join us next week. Uh, and you can watch the replay here for this week. Uh, Steve, anything else you want to say before we're done here? No, we probably ought to put out reminders to folks to bring their lawn chairs Bring your lawn uh, chairs. That's right. Yeah. If you want to sit down, bring, bring those chairs. lawn chairs. Uh, we'll make sure to get an email out to the folks who signed up and just let them know, hey, if you want to take a take a load off, bring that chair. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next week. MuleRanch.com. Yeah, Steve? One more little thing. I have for sale a 2015 Dodge one ton with a flatbed on it. There you we're go. Gonna we're going to get pictures on my website, you'll be able to see it. The truck's only got uh, 84,000 miles on it. It's uh, been kept serviced. It's a great truck, uh, but my president Trump said I should have a new truck. So I went ahead and did like he told me and I bought a new truck. There so, we go. Yeah, you so can ride on the wheels that have taken Steve Edwards across North America. All you have to do is call 602-999-6853. And I know Steve Edwards personally. He will make you a deal. Folks, thank you for hanging out. Appreciate you. Uh, thank you for being willing to put in the time to love and care for these animals. Uh, Steve's given his life uh, over these last 40 years to educating folks. And uh, we hope you will do the same. Share this information with others. Take care, everyone. See ya. Bye-bye.